Sadly, the original master recording of the following sermon by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones did not survive. However, we have been able to obtain a very poor quality copy of the sermon and processed it digitally to improve the quality. However, we do hope this will not spoil your enjoyment of the following sermon by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. Luke. In the 8th chapter, verses 22 to 25, verses 22 to 25 in the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they laughed forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him, and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose, and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of men is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Now I want to call attention particularly to that question which was addressed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the disciples. He said unto them, Where is your faith? Where is your faith? I call your attention to this entire incident as a part of our consideration on these Sunday mornings of the subject of what we have described as spiritual depression. We are considering the various causes why it is, unfortunately, or less the truth to say, that certain Christian people are miserable. We are considering the case of the miserable Christian, the unhappy Christian the one who is suffering from spiritual depression. We've already considered a number of causes, and we are looking at this particular incident in the life and ministry of our Lord because it brings us face to face with yet another cause. And the one that obviously is dealt with here is the whole problem and question of the nature of faith. In other words, there are many Christians who get into difficulties and are unhappy from time to time, because they clearly have not understood the nature of faith. Well, you say, if they haven't understood the nature of faith, how can they be Christians? The answer is this. What makes one Christian is that one is given the gift of faith. We are given the gift of faith by God through the Holy Spirit, and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that saves us. But that doesn't mean that we understand the nature of faith. And so it comes to pass that whereas, well, that while we may be truly Christian and genuinely saved because we've received this gift of faith, we may subsequently get into trouble in our spiritual experience because we haven't understood the nature of faith. It was originally given as a gift, but from there on, as I hope to show you this morning, uh, we have to do certain things about it. Now, this is uh, a very striking incident which brings out that vital importance of distinguishing between the gift of faith originally and the work of faith or the life of faith which comes subsequently. God starts us off in this life, then we have to walk in this life. We work by faith, not by sight, and so on. Well, very well. Now, that's the theme which we are considering together this morning. Before I come actually to that particular theme, we must say just a few words about this great incident in and of itself, looked at from any standpoint. It's a very interesting and a very important incident. It has a great deal to tell us, for instance, about the person of our Lord himself. It brings us face to face with what is described as the paradox, the seeming contradiction in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There he is, Weary and tired. So tired, in fact, that he fell asleep. 
Now, this incident is recorded by the, the, the three so-called synaptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it is very important from the standpoint of understanding the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I say, you look at him and you say, obviously, he's a man. He is fatigued, he's tired, he's weary, so much so that he just falls asleep and there are stammers in his fingers and sleeping. He's subject to infirmity. He's a man in the body and the flesh like all the rest of them. A man, you say. Oh, yes, but wait a minute. Listen to this. They came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the sea. And they ceased. And there was a calm. One of the others describes it as a great calm. Oh, it's not surprising that the disciples, seeing all this, wondered and said one to another, What manner of men is this? For he commanded even the winds and water, and they obey. Well, there it is. Man, and yet obviously God. He can command the element. He can silence the wind and stop the raging of the sea. He is the Lord of nature and of creation. He is the Lord of the universe. Here, this is the mystery and the marvel of Jesus Christ, God and man. Two natures, one person. Two natures unmixed, yet resident in the same person. Well, I say, it is a very remarkable and striking illustration of that great and all important fact. And we must start with it, because if we're not clear about that, there's no purpose in our going on. If you don't believe in the unique deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, well, you're just not a Christian, whatever else you may be. We are not looking at a good man only. We are not interested merely in the greatest teacher that the world has ever seen. We are face to face with the fact that God the eternal Son has been in this world and took upon him human nature and dwelt amongst us a man amongst men, God man. The mystery, the marvel of the incarnation, the virgin birth, it's all here. Here it shines out in all the fullness of its amazing glory. What manner of man is this? He's more than man, that's the answer. He's God man. However, I say that is not, it seems to me, the special purpose of this particular incident. You get that in other places also. It shines out right through all the Gospels. But these separate particular incidents in which that is seen generally also have some special and peculiar lesson of their own to teach us. And there can be no doubt, as I've suggested, <laughs> that that peculiar and special message in this uh, particular case is uh, this uh, lesson with regard to the disciples and with regard to their condition at this point. It's a great lesson concerning faith and the nature of the character of faith. I don't know what you feel, but I never cease to be grateful to these disciples. I'm grateful to them for every mistake they ever made, for every blunder they ever committed, because I see myself in them. How grateful we should be to God that we have these scriptures. How grateful to God that he hasn't merely given us an experience and left it at that. How wonderful it is that we can read an account like this and see ourselves in it. And how grateful to God that it's a divinely inspired word that speaks the truth and doesn't try to paint pictures of its heroes as if they were perfect. It shows us them in all their human limitations and fallibility. It records all their mistakes and all their failures, and here they are. And uh, so we find our Lord rebuking these men. He rebukes them because of their alarm, because of their terror, because of their lack of faith. Here they are, you see, they're in the boat with him, and the storm arises, and uh, they've done everything they can to bail out the water, but it's getting filled up. We are told they were filled with water, and they could see that in a few moments the ship was going to sink. They've done everything they could, 
but it didn't uh, seem to be of any value, nor of any avail. And uh, what amuses them is that their master is still sleeping sadly in the stern of the vessel. Well, they go to him and they shake him and they awaken him and say, Master, Master, as another one of these evangelists puts it, carest thou not that we perish? Are you unconcerned about it all? And he arose, and having rebuked the wind, and having rebuked the sea, he rebuked them. And we must be careful to observe this rebuke, and to understand what he was saying. What was our Lord saying to them? Well, he was rebuking them for one thing. For being in such a state at all. What is your faith, Ethan? Some of the others put it, O oh, ye of little faith. He marveled at their unbelief, we are told. He rebukes them. He rebukes them for being in that state of agitation and terror and of alarm while he is with them in the boat. Now, my friends, well, this is the first great lesson we have to point uh, to ourselves and one another this morning. It is very wrong for a Christian ever to be in such a condition. I don't care what the circumstances. A Christian should never be agitated. A Christian should never be beside himself like this. A Christian should never be at his wit's ends and full of terror and alarm. A Christian should never be in a condition in which he has lost control of himself. That's the first lesson. It's a lesson we've been pointing on several Sunday mornings. But it's an essential part of the New Testament teaching. A Christian... It would never be depressed, agitated, alarmed, frantic, not knowing what to do, like another worldly person. You see, that's why it's so wrong. This is a typical reaction on the part of those who are not Christians. But a Christian is different from other people. A Christian has something which the non-Christian doesn't possess. And the idea for the Christian is that which is stated so perfectly by the Apostle Paul, you remember, in the fourth chapter of the Epistle to the Philippians, learned, in whatsoever state I am, therein to be content. I know both how to be a priest and how to abound. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's the Christian position. That's what the Christian is meant to be like. The Christian also is never meant to be carried away by his feelings, whatever they are. Never. That is always wrong in the Christian. The Christian is always to be controlled as I'm going on to say. The trouble with these men was that they were lacking in self-control. And that's why they were miserable. That's why they were unhappy. That's why they were alarmed and agitated. The, the Son of God is with them in the boat. I can't emphasize this too strongly. I'm simply laying it down as a proposition. The Christian should never lose self-control. The Christian is never meant to be in a state of agitation and terror and alarm, whatever the circumstances. That's obviously the first lesson, isn't it? The position of these people was desperate. They were in jeopardy. It looked as if they were going to be drowned the next moment. Yet our Lord says, you shouldn't be in that condition, you know. Being my fellows, my people, you have no right to be as you are, though you're in chapel. Very well, that's the first great lesson. And of course the second is this. What is so wrong about this condition is that it implies a lack of trust and a lack of confidence in him. That's the problem. And that is why it is so reprehensible. That is why he reprimanded these men at this point. He was saying in effect to them. Do you feel like this in spite of the fact that I'm with you? Don't you trust me? As I say, one of the other evangelists reports it like that, that they said to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? No, I don't think they were referring only to themselves. Some people have suggested that, that they were so self-centered and self-concerned that what they said to him was this, Master, don't you care that we are going to be drowned without considering him? I don't believe they meant that for a moment. I think they were including him as well. They thought that he and they were all going to be drowned. Master, where are they still not that we can? In other words, this agitation and alarm and... Uh, 
violent concern always carries implicit in it a lack of trust and a lack of confidence in him. It's a lack of faith in his concern for us and in his care for us. It means that we take charge again and again to look after ourselves and the situation, feeling that he doesn't care or that he can't for them. And that is what makes this so terrible. But I wonder whether we always realize that. It seems fairly obvious as we look on at it objectively in the case of these disciples, doesn't it? But my friend, uh, uh, when you and I are agitated or disturbed uh, or don't know what to do and uh, give an impression of that nervous tension and that apprehension, anybody looking at us, at us is entitled to say this. That person hasn't much faith in his or her Lord. There doesn't seem to be much point in being a Christian after all. There isn't much value in Christianity, but look at that person. Now, we were all subject to this during the war, and the air raids, but whatever comes across our path and puts us in difficulties, at once we proclaim that we really think about him and believe in him by our response and our reaction too. So that there, it seems to me, on the very surface are these two great lessons. We must never allow ourselves to become agitated and disturbed in this way because to do so implies a lack of faith, a lack of trust, a lack of confidence in our blessed Lord and God. However, let's go and look at it in detail. There are the two great lessons. But now let us draw some uh, general principles out of this incident and its great teaching. First of all, in looking at this whole question of faith, let me say a word about what I may call the trial of faith. The trial of faith. Scripture is full of this idea of the trial of one's faith. Take that great 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, a portion of which we read at the beginning. That's in a sense nothing but a great exposition on this theme of the trial of faith. Every one of those men was tried. He'd been given a great promise and he'd accepted it and then, well, everything seemed to go wrong. Think of any one of them you like. It's still available. Think of the trials of a man like Noah, trials of a man like Abraham, the trials that Jacob had to endure, and Moses especially. Yes, given the gift of faith, but then the faith is fine. Peter, in writing his first epistle in the first chapter, has exactly the same thing. He says that, uh, that they, they were in heaviness uh, for a season because of certain circumstances, but he says that the object of that is that the trial of your faith is, uh, which is more precious than of gold that carries it, very big tied with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That the trial of your faith, which is much more precious than gold, the perisheth and so on. I say that this is the theme of the scripture. You get it in the patriarchs and all the Old Testament saints. You get it running through the New Testament. And of course, it's the great theme of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Well, very well then, let's be clear about this. We must start by learning that uh, we may well find ourselves in which our faith is going to be fine. Then, are allowed by God. If we enter into the Christian life, or are trying to live the Christian life at the moment on the assumption that it means just this, come to Christ and you'll never have another worry in the hell of your life, it's a terrible fallacy. In fact, it's a delusion. It's not true. Our faith will be tried, and James goes so far as to say, count it all joy, my brethren, when he fell into diverse temptations or trials. Oh yes, God permits storms. He permits difficulties. He permits the wind to blow and the billows to blow, and everything seems to be going wrong, and we're in jeopardy. Now we've got to realize that as we come to try to understand this whole question of faith. God uh, doesn't uh, take his people and lead them into some kind of Elysium 
in which they protected magically from all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Not at all. We are living in the same world as everybody else. Indeed, the Apostle Paul seems to go further than that. He says to the Philippians, unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer shame for his name's sake. In the world, says the Lord himself, in the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, yes. But remember, you'll have the tribulation. All again and then about going on their missionary journey, visited the churches and said, it is through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Very well, then I say, we must start by realizing that. To be forewarned is to be forearmed in this matter. If we have a semi-magical conception of the Christian life, we are certain to find ourselves sooner or later in trouble. Because when the difficulties come, we say, why is this happening? Why is this allowed? Is that God still love me? Are his promises true? And we should never ask such questions. And we never would ask them if we only realize this principle. That the Lord enters the ship and goes to sleep and allows the storm to come. And I say that the position may indeed become quite desperate. We need trouble. Well, what do seem to be again? Well, there it is again, I say that, and reminds me of the hymn. A Christian man writes like this. When all things seem against me, that drive me to despair. He doesn't drive him to despair because he goes on to say, I know one gate is open. One ear will hear my prayer. But things themselves are desperate. All things seem against me, says the Christian, that drive me to despair. Now, let's be prepared for that. Yes, but uh, we must even go further. While all this is happening to us, we appears to be utterly concerned about it. That's where the trial of faith comes in, isn't it? The wind and the billows were bad enough, and the water was coming into the ship. All that was terrible. But the thing that was to them most terrible of all was, was apparent and concerned. Still sleeping. Not caring about him. Not the terrorist or not the three He appears to be unconcerned. Unconcerned about us. Unconcerned about himself. Unconcerned about his cause. Unconcerned about his thing. Just imagine the feelings of these men. They had gone after him and they would listened to his teaching about the coming of the kingdom. They'd seen his miracles and they were expecting marvelous things to happen. And now he's witnessed that everything was going to end in shipwreck and in being drowned. What an anti climate Because of his unconcern. Oh, we must be very young indeed in the Christian life. Unless we know something about this. Don't we all know something about this position of trial and of difficulty? Yes, and a feeling that God somehow doesn't seem to care. He doesn't do anything about it. Why does he allow me to suffer as a Christian at the hands of an non Christian, says the person? Why does he allow things to go wrong with me and not to go wrong with the other person? Why is that man successful and I unsuccessful? Why doesn't God do something about it? Oh, how often have Christian people asked that question? They have asked it about the whole state of the church today. They say, why doesn't God send revival? Why does he allow these infidels and skeptics, these rationalists, to attack the faith? Why doesn't God come in and do something and revive his work? Why not? How often we are tempted to say such things, exactly as these people were. He permits these things, and he even appears to be quite unconcerned about it all. Now, all that constitutes what I am describing as the trial of faith. Those are the conditions in which our faith is tried and tested and sifted. And God allows it all, I say. God permits it all. And James goes on to say, Count it all dry, my brethren, when that happens to you. Oh, this is a great subject, this. The trial of faith. We don't talk much about this, do we? But if you went back to the 17th and the 18th century, you'd find it was a very great theme. 
I suppose in many ways it was the central theme of the Puritans, the trial of faith. It was equally the theme of the leaders of the evangelical awakening. The trial of a man's faith, the walk of faith, the life of faith, and how to overcome these things. Very well, do we get that? Let's turn to our second question. What is the nature of faith? The character of faith. Now, this is, uh, above everything, the particular message of this incident. And I feel that it is brought out especially in this record of this event in the Gospel according to St. Luke, and that's why I am taking this incident from this particular Gospel. The way in which I had puts the question, where is your faith? Now, there's the key to the whole problem. You see, our Lord's question, it seems to me, implies this. That he knows perfectly well that they have been. The question he asks them is this, where is it? You've got it, but where is it? Where is your faith? You've got your faith, but where is it at this moment? It ought to be here, but it isn't there. Where is it? Now then, that gives us the key to the understanding of the nature of faith. Let me first of all put it negatively. Faith, obviously, is not a mere matter of feeling. You see, faith is patently not a matter of feeling because uh, one's feelings in this kind of condition cannot be very happy and very pleasurable. A Christian is not a man who has to feel happy when everything goes wrong. As I pointed out a few Sunday mornings ago, He's never told to be happy when things are going wrong, but he's told to rejoice when they're going wrong. Feeling is belonging to this happiness. Rejoicing, it takes in something much bigger than feeling. And the danger is that if we regard faith as merely a matter of feeling, when things go wrong, the feeling will go, and the faith will seem to go. But you see, faith is not a matter of feeling at all. Faith, as we've already seen, it takes up the whole man, its mind, its intellect, its understanding, its reception of truth, and what I'm going to say. But clearly, it isn't a mere matter of feeling. Ah, but the second thing is still more important. Faith is not something that acts automatically. Faith is not something that acts magically. Now, this, I think, is the blunder of which we've all at some time or another been guilty. We seem to think that faith is something that acts automatically. Many people, it seems to me, conceive of faith as if it were something similar to those thermal steps, you know, which you have in connection with heating apparatus. Unfortunately, the next few moments of this sermon by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones are missing. However, the following paragraph is taken from a transcript of the sermon. Many people, it seems to me, conceive of faith as if it were something similar to those thermostats which you have in connection with a heating apparatus. You set your thermostat at a given level, you want to maintain the temperature at a certain point, and it acts automatically. If the temperature is tending to rise above that, the thermostat comes into operation and brings it down. If you use your hot water and the temperature is lowered, the thermostat comes into operation and sends it up. You do not have to do anything about it. The thermostat acts automatically, and it brings the temperature back to the desired level automatically. Now, there are many people who seem to think that faith acts like that. They assume that it doesn't matter what happens to them, that faith will operate and all will be well. Faith, however, is not something that acts magically, or automatically. If it did, these men would never have been in trouble. Faith would have come into operation and they would have been calm and quiet and all would have been well. But faith is not like that and those are utter fallacies with respect to it. What is faith? Let us look at it positively. The principle taught here is that faith is an activity. It is something that has to be exercised. It doesn't come into operation itself. You and I have to put it into operation. It is a form of activity. And it is at this point we rejoin the doctor. Now let me divide that up a bit. 
Insight uh, is something that even I have to bring into authority. That's exactly what our Lord said to these men. He said, prayer is your turn. Why are you not taking yourself and applying it to this position? Prayer is it. You see, it is something that you and I have to put them to operation. And it was because they hadn't done that that the disciples had become agitated and unhappy and were in this state of constant Then I then said from them, how does one put faith into operation? What do you mean? What do you mean by saying that faith is something that we have to apply and to put into operation? Well, I divide it in this way. The first thing that I must do when I find myself in this difficult position is, I must refuse to allow myself to be controlled by the situation. That's the first thing. Again, that's a negative you see. These men are in the boat, the master's asleep, and the billows are rolling, and the water's coming in, and they can't bail it out fast enough, and it looks as if they're going to sink. Now then, the trouble was they were immediately controlled by that decide, oh, what can we do? Now they could have been men who could have applied their fancy, could have taken part of the situation. They could have said, no, we're not going to be panicked. What is this position? They could have started thinking, but they didn't start thinking. They allowed the position to control them, and they became panicked. Oh, therefore, is a refusal to tell. Do you like that sort of definition of faith? Does that seem to you to be too earthly and insufficiently spiritual? My dear friend, it's the essence of faith. Faith is a refusal to tell. Come what may. Browning, you know, I think he got that kind of idea in his mind when he defined faith like this. Faith, you said, you know, is like unbelief, but quiet, like the snake meets Michael's foot. He's got a picture of it. Here is this man, Michael, standing, and there's a snake beneath his foot, wiggling, ready to bite him and to kill him. And he just keeps him quiet by the pattern of his foot. See? Look, that from one angle, he is nothing but unbelief in the form of a foot, and just quiet, just does him. That's what these men didn't do. They allowed all these things to grip them and to, to grasp them and to control them, and they refused to become panicky. Hence, it's a refusal to become panicky. It's as I'm not going to be controlled by events and circumstances, whatever they are. Are you in control? You take charge of yourself. You pull yourself up. You control yourself. You don't let yourself go. You don't become a victim. You assert yourself. That's the first thing. But of course it doesn't stop at that. That isn't enough. That might lead to nothing but resignation and a kind of spherical form. That isn't the essence of faith, it's that. Having done that, and you've got to do that first. Because if you don't control events, they'll control you. But having done that, you do this. You then go on to remind yourself of what you believe and what you know. Again, you see, that's what these foolish disciples didn't do. If they'd only stopped for a moment and had said, well, now, what about it? Is it possible that we are going to drown with him in the boat? Is there anything that he can't do? We've seen his miracles. He can turn water into wine. He can heal the blind and the lame. He can even raise the dead. Is it likely that he is going to allow us and himself to be drowned in this way? Impossible. In any case, he loves us. He cares for us. He's told us that all the hairs of our head are numbered. That's the way it comes reason, you think. It says, all right, I see the billows and the waves, and I see the water coming in. But it puts up its butt. It puts up its purpose. That's fun. It falls on the truth. It says, I know this. I put this against that. That's the application of it, you see. These men didn't do that. And that is why they became agitated and excited and panicked. And that is why you and I, whenever we become panicky and agitated, I fail to do the same thing. My friend, whatever your circumstances, stand, wait for a moment and say, Oh, right, right, I admit it all, but... But what? But God. But the Lord Jesus Christ. But what? 
the whole of my salvation. That's what faith does. All things seem against me to drive me to despair. I don't know what, what's happening, what's, what's taking place, but I know this. I know that God has so loved me that he sent his only begotten Son into this world for me. I know that while I was an enemy, God sent his only Son to die on the cross and tell that he's ill for me. He's done that for me. For I was alone, a rebel and an end. I know that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I know that it is at the cost of his life and his blood that I have salvation and that I am a child of God and an heir of everlasting and eternal death. I know that. Well, very well then. I know this. That if while we were enemies we were reconciled unto God by the death of his Son, how much more shall we be saved by his life? It's inevitable logic. Now faith argues like that. Faith, you see, reminds itself of what the scriptures call the exceeding great and precious promises. Faith says, I can't believe that you have brought me so far. It's better let me go down at this point. It's impossible. He doesn't do things like that. It would be inconsistent with the character of God. So faith, having stood and refusing to be controlled, reminds itself of what it believes and what it knows. And then the next step is this. It applies all that to this particular situation. And you see, that was what these men hadn't done. And that's why our Lord puts it like this to them. Where is your faith? You've done it. Why didn't you apply it? Why didn't you bring all you know to bear upon this city with? Why didn't you focus it on this particular problem? That's the next step in the application of faith. Where is it? Well, my friend, whatever your circumstances at this moment, bring all you know to be true about your relationship to God to bear upon it. Oh. And then you'll know this full well, that he will never allow anything to happen to you that is harmful. All things work together for good to them that love God. Not a hair of your vengeance. He loves you with an everlasting I don't suggest that you'll be able to understand everything that's happening. You won't have a full explanation of it all, but you'll know that for certain. That God is not a concern. It's impossible. The one who's done this big thing must be concerned about it. And though the clouds are there and you can't see his face, you know he's there behind a frowning providence. He hides a father's face. Now you hold on to that. You say, I don't see him smiling, but I know he is smiling. These earth-born clouds prevent my seeing him, but I know he is there, and will never suffer anything harmful to take place. That's the language of faith. You've applied it to the present position. And that is the great lesson of faith. I don't care what's happening to you. It may be some great disappointment. It may be an illness. It may be some sort of fancy. It may be some fancy. I don't know what it is. But you can be certain of this. That God permits that thing to happen to you because it's ultimately for you are good. No question for the present is pleasurable or dire, but grievous rather. But afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. My friend, that's the way faith works. But you see, you and I have got to do it. It doesn't come into operation automatically. No, no. You've got to face these things and say, all oh, right. I know this about God, and because that is true, I'm going to apply it to this, and this can't be what I think it is. It must be something else. And you end by seeing that it's God's greatest purpose for you. And then, of course, having applied it, you just hold on. You just refuse to be moved. The enemy will come back and he'll attack you. The water will seem to be pouring in. You'll just say, it's all right. I know, it's all right. Let the West come to the West. You stand on their faith. 
You say, I believe this. I'm resting on this. I'm certain of this. And whether I understand or not, I'm holding on to this. That's it. Well, that brings me to our final word, which is my third principle. The value of even the weakest or the smallest thing. We've looked at the trial of faith. We've looked at the nature of faith. Let me say just a closing word on the value of even the weakest and the smallest thing. What's that? It's this. However poor and however small and however unapplied the faith of these disciples was on this occasion, they at any rate had the right amount of faith to make them do the right thing in the end. They go to him. Having been agitated and desperate and alarmed and excited, they go to whom? They all be well, but they go to whom? They still have got some kind of feeling that he can do something about it at any rate. So they're waiting and they say, Master, aren't you doing something about it? It's all right. That is very poor faith, very weak faith, but it's faith, thank God. And this even a faith like a grain of mustard seed is all right because it takes us to him. And when you do go to him, this is what you'll find. He will be disappointed in you, and he won't conceal that. He'll rebuke you. He'll say, where was your faith? He'll say, why didn't you reason it out? Why didn't you apply your faith? Why did you appear agitated like that before that worldly person? Why did you behave as if you were not a Christian at all and had no faith? Why didn't you apply your faith? Where was your faith? You should have been and I would have been so pleased if I could have watched you standing like a man in the midst of the hurricane and the storm. Oh, why didn't you? He'll let us know that he's disappointed in us. And he'll rebuke us. But blessed be his name. He'll nevertheless still receive us. He doesn't drive us away. He didn't drive these men away. He received them. He receives us. Yes, he'll not only receive us, he'll bless us. He'll even give us peace. No, he rebuked them. He got up and he rebuked the wind and the sea. And there was a great calm. He produced the conditions they were so anxious to have in spite of their failure. Such is the gracious Lord that you and I trust in and believe in and follow. Though he is disappointed in us often and though he rebukes us, he'll never reject us. He'll receive us, he'll bless us, he'll give us peace. And indeed he'll probably do with us what he did with these people. He gave them a still greater conception of himself than he'd ever done before. They were marvel, full of marvel and amazement. At his wonderful power, he, as it were, threw something into the bargain on top of all the blessing. Very well, then, I close by putting it like this. If you find yourself in this position of trial and of trouble and of testing, take it as a wonderful opportunity of proving your faith, of showing your faith, of manifesting your faith and bringing glory to his great and holy name. But if you should fail to do that, if you should apparently be too weak to do it, if you're being so besieged and attacked by the devil and by who and by the world let loose against you, and you feel you can't, and in your helplessness, well then I say this, fly to him at once, and he'll receive you, and he'll bless you. He'll give you deliverance. He'll give you peace. Faith is an activity. It is something that has to be applied. Where is your faith? Let us make certain that it is always at the place and at the point of need and of testing. Amen. Amen.